Happy Valley Conservancy and today we're out here at the Holland Sand Prairie for a Link to the Land virtual hike. It's a beautiful day and uh, we are practicing social distancing in putting this video together and we hope you'll do the same when you come out here to see all the beautiful prairie awakening and beauty that's happening on this lovely early summer day. Um, I'm now going to introduce you to Jim Rogala. He is a he is a prairie enthusiast, and he is an ecologist and a real expert on what happens on prairies, how they what they do for us, and why they're important to protect. So, um, thanks for being here, Jim, and uh, tell us a little about it. Good morning. Uh, yeah, so the prairie always has something up in bloom, usually from starting in April through October. Uh, today we're here on May 29th. Uh, some species have already bloomed. We'll see some that are bloomed now, and of course there's much more to come this summer. Uh, before we start on the hike, we're gonna spend a little time giving a little background information about the site. The Holland Sand Prairie is near Holman, Wisconsin, about 10 or 15 miles north of La Crosse. It's owned by the town of Holland and is permanently protected by Mississippi Valley Conservancy since 2004. It's managed and maintained in partnership of the town, Friends of the Holland Sand Prairie, the Conservancy, and the Prairie Enthusiasts. Now surrounded by much development, the value of this place is greater than ever for all of us and especially for the native plants and wildlife. This 61 acre property is one of the last larger portions of a much larger series of sand prairies on terraces of the upper Mississippi River. Uh, these formed as part of the glacial retreat. Uh, where we're standing right now was actually at one time underwater. Uh, sands were being transported by the waters. Uh, when the waters went down, a lot of sands were deposited. Uh, those sands then were, took a while for them to become vegetated. While they were unvegetated, the wind blew the sand around, so you get these dunes out on this location. Uh, today, of course, the, the floodplain of the river is much farther down, uh, off to the west of us. Uh, along these dunes, uh, the ridges contain a lot of the diversity in the prairie, uh, and we'll visit those as we uh, hike today. Uh, on these dunes, we find approximately 150 different plant species, and uh, some of those are of uh, special concern. Uh, of course, in addition to that, the uh, plants themselves uh, provide habitat for birds, butterflies, uh, mammals, uh, and other forms of life. Uh, prairies also serve important functions. For example, many prairie plants have deep roots. These deep roots then uh, can sequester carbon. Uh, it's stored in the, the deep roots, which may go 10 to 15 feet down. Uh, in addition, these deep roots are also a good conduit for water, so the soils are well-drained, uh, better control of runoff of water from uh, high rainfall events. Uh, I'll try to point out some other of these highlights as we uh, hike around today. Lead the way, Jim. We can't wait to see what's happening on the prairie. Let's go. Okay, we've walked about 50 yards from the kiosk along this ridge. I'm going to point out some of the species that are blooming right now. Uh, one of those is the bird's foot violet. Uh, this is actually towards the tail end now. Uh, these are kind of fading apart. Uh, so there's two prairie violets that you're going to find out here. This is the bird's foot violet. The other one is the prairie violet. We should see that uh, on another ridge later on on the hike. Uh, over here we have a prairie ragwort. This is one of the short-lived species on a prairie. It's a biennial. Uh, typically we think of uh, prairie plants as being long-lived, and most of them are, but there are some uh, annuals and biennials on the, the prairie as well. So here's one of the long-lived species. This is the hairy pacoon. Uh, there's three pacoons that are common in this uh, area here. Uh, this is the one that's most common on the sand prairies, uh, particularly at this site. Uh, the other pacoons, hoary pacoon, which actually we'll see on a ridge top later again and the uh, fringe pacoon, find more of those up on the hill prairies. Uh, again, these are long-lived species and one of those really deep-rooted species uh, that's on the prairie. I want to point out a couple plants that aren't in bloom uh, to further uh, explain these adaptations. Uh, first of all, we have the uh, lead plant. This will bloom uh, later this summer. 
that's uh, actually a shrub. There are some shrubs that live on the prairie, and we'll see some of those on some other ridge tops. So again, the adaptations here, very deep rooted, long lived. Uh, the buds, the regrowth that comes uh, for the new growth is pretty deep, so it survives through the fires. There's another plant that has an adaptation. This one's almost in flower. It's the bastard toad flax. Uh, this plant actually takes nutrients and water from other plants. Uh, typically trees, so that's one way for it to deal with these harsh conditions. As noted in the name of the hairy hawkweed, a lot of these sand prairie plants have hairs on them. Uh, helps them survive the harsh conditions. Uh, this one here is the uh, hairy hawkweed, kind of gone uh, on steroids here with the, the hairs on it. So again, different ways of dealing with the harsh environments of the prairie. short uh, stop here we want to talk a little bit about management on the way to the next ridge and most of the management is occurring in these low-lying low -lying areas uh, between the ridges uh, so behind me you see a bunch of trees uh, and as you know prairies uh, typically don't have trees on so we have work to remove the trees and shrubs as much as possible uh, so that's an ongoing piece of work uh, eventually we'd like to see this landscape nearly uh, a treeless. Uh, so that involves a lot of work cutting and uh, in most cases using herbicide to, to, to kill the trees. Uh, we also have these low areas that have uh, non-native grasses in. So most of the green you see now that's grass is non-native. So we uh, go ahead and try to increase the diversity in those areas by seeding. So this was done with planting through uh, the grill, growing seeds in. Uh, we also do some uh, interseeding continually throughout the years by collecting seed on the site and then uh, scattering it within these areas that need more diversity. Uh, another project was to actually grab the hunks of sod that had good prairie plants on it from a neighboring property and bring them in and plant them within the, the Howland Sand Prairie. Uh, so that uh, was uh, of limited success because we actually brought some invasive species in at the same time. So invasive species are another issue we have to deal with. Uh, they're constantly coming in and we need to uh, remove them before they uh, take over and, and uh, force the native uh, plants out. And then uh, one of the things that prairies uh, need as part of the management are burns. Uh, so here you can see our fire break for this year, which of course we couldn't burn because of uh, the pandemic. Uh, but we mow the fire breaks and then uh, mow, uh, go ahead and burn areas. And those areas are selected such that we don't burn too frequently. And also there's always some kind of a refugia, so an area that's not burned so that uh, certain uh, insects and other critters that need to be uh, out of the fire uh, can uh, survive in that area. So we already saw the hairy pacoon. So this is the, the hoary pacoon, the other pacoon that's fairly common, uh, but not on this site. In fact, very few of these. Uh, and, and we're in this lower area, so this is where we see some different species. Uh, you know, the hairy pacoon is later in the year, uh, so you know, you'll see that in June, into June. This one's just finishing up now. Most of these were blooming probably uh, three weeks ago. Ridge here. We're actually on the, on the lower side of the ridge, and this is where the uh, prairie violet can be found. So, this species is uh, very similar as far as what the leaves look like, but the, the flower is different. Uh, that first foot violet had an uh, orange protruding part to it, it's a stamen uh, that's unique for the bird foot violet. The prairie violet has just uh, white hairs in that area. So, again, that's one of the early species. Uh, you know, low-growing species that blooms, and again, this is the latest you're going to see this uh, this species here. The other early species that's growing uh, uh, <coughs> dense out here on the uh, this ridge here is the past flower. Of course, well past uh, bloom time, and here you can see where the bloom was, and now setting a a seed head there. Uh, these are very similar to the prairie smoke, which we'll look at in a minute. You have these long filaments on that uh, help in dispersal of the seeds. So here we have a, uh, a pretty good patch of prairie smoke. This is pretty common up here on this, this ridge here, along with the uh, pass flower. Uh, 
And this one here still has some blooms on it. So it's an early species, but still blooming. So these are the flowers here. And on the same plant, or nearby plants, you start starting to see the seed heads form. Again, these long plumes of uh, filaments off the seeds that are used for dispersal of the seeds. out the flowers. Of course, the prairies are known for their grasses and they're a very important component. Uh, it's what carries the fires uh, when we do prescribe burns. Uh, there's different types of grasses on the prairie. Uh, most of the green you see now, as I pointed out earlier, is uh, non-native, but there are a couple of early uh, prairie species uh, and uh, we might find those later, but I'll talk about them now. There's a uh, June grass, which is a shorter grass. Uh, and again, it's almost in flower now, I saw some earlier. And the other one is porcupine grass. Both of those are seeding out pretty early in the year. The rest of them are all called warm season grasses. So they just get going, they seed out later in the year. And most of them are bunch grasses. So here's an example of a bunch grass. This is one plant here. Uh, this is probably the ultimate bunch grass. It's called the prairie dropsy. What it does is it, it ends up laying down all of its grass from the year before, forming a big clump where nothing else can grow. So that's going to stake its territory there. Prairie dropsy. Uh, another short grass. Uh, and again, this illustrates that the warm season grass. All this brown here is last year's growth. So here, this one's just getting started now. Uh, so this is one of the shorter grasses on the prairie, a uh, little blue stem. Uh, the other short grass that's common out here is the uh, Cytos garama, which I don't see any around here. And then we have some taller grasses. Uh, those include uh, this is Indian grass here. What's left of it again, it's just getting started here. It's a warm season grass and a uh, big blue stem is also so the main grasses you'll see. Uh, component of that within the prairie kind of varies with uh, in many cases grazing so this uh, land was probably grazed at some point so there's probably less grass than there was in the past but still there's some areas where there's some nice uh, uh, especially short grasses here in the dry prairie uh, they're pretty common. Controlling the woody species, the trees and shrubs. In some cases, we want to keep some of the shrubs. We've got at least one species that prefers a, a shrub for nesting, and that's the Mills area. Uh, but they're kind of picky about where they nest, so they don't want individual shrubs, and they don't want really large clumps either. So behind me, you can see this mowed path, and it's through a plum thicket. The plum thicket was actually too large for the Bells area to use, so we've cut a path down the middle. Now there's two different uh, clumps there that the Bells can use for nesting. One of the unique milkweeds for these sand prairies. It's called uh, clasping milkweed. It's got the clasping leaves, or it's actually called sand milkweed because it's found in these sand prairies. Uh, so again, here's another milkweed that can be used by uh, the monarch butterfly. Uh, actually, here's a common milkweed here too. So lots of milkweeds uh, around, and all these plants, uh, you know, they might provide the same type of a function for other uh, butterflies or moths or bees. So all these species, this diversity we have is important for uh, not just things like the monarch, which everyone sees, but all these smaller, uh, less uh, familiar inverts that uh, need these plants to survive. So here we have another species just coming into bloom. This is the spiderwort. Uh, so this will, you know, we're almost into June here. In June, you'll see a good show of this, and at the same time, you'll see the, the hairy pecoon. So you have a nice combination of blue and, and yellow, uh, so it's a really showy time of the year. Uh, also, I noticed now we have uh, the grass I talked about earlier, June grass, the season grass, uh, getting close to flowering. We have the short grasses that uh, bloom early as opposed to the other grasses, which are going to be blooming uh, and setting seed later in the spring. So do you have a favorite time of year out here, Jim? Uh, I don't think I could narrow it down. I could think of four really showy time periods. Uh, one has already passed, so we have the uh, very early show of the pasque flower and the uh, prairie smoke with some violets mixed in. So that's the you know, end of April. Uh, this up, one that's coming up here is a nice uh, time period. So you've got the spiderwort and hairy pecoon. 
Uh, I mentioned that the uh, slope there, that in fall you've got the, the showy goldenrod and the blazing star. Uh, again, that combination of blue and, and gold. Uh, so those are probably my favorites. Uh, one other that I would like to come out just to see a single species, and that's the silky prairie clover, which I haven't talked about. A very unique uh, species on these sand prairies. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, you're probably looking at the end of June for that. So no hike is complete on the Holland Sand Prairie for me unless I stop to see the cactus. We have cactus at a couple locations on the site. Uh, this is the prickly pear cactus. And these are, uh, they're actually spreading by these pads breaking off primarily. Uh, it does flower and set seed, but uh, more than likely the pads are just spreading and we're finding it uh, at different locations now. Uh, so many people will believe that we have cactus in uh, Wisconsin, actually, uh, and we don't have them at this site, but on uh, prairies in Wisconsin, we also have some lizards. So uh, you know, things that we think of in really dry uh, climates, uh, we find on these dry prairies. We're grateful for volunteers like Jim Regala, who share the knowledge about habitats that are unique to this area. The Holland Sand Prairie is one of 27 nature preserves protected by the Conservancy with public access here in the Driftless area. You can find trail maps and information about all of them on our website at www.mississippivalleyconservancy.org. Thanks for watching this Link to the Land tour. We hope to see you on the trail again soon. Thank you.